Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I just came from <coughs> Bremen, uh, where we had uh, the event about uh, the 20th uh, anniversary of German unification in Bremen with a formal uh, festival act uh, and the speech of the new president uh, of Germany, of Mr. Wolf. And um, in general, now we are coming to an end with all these 20th uh, anniversaries because uh, we started last year, uh, last year, uh, with the beginning of last year, because in that time, uh, 20 years ago, it started the round table in Poland. And uh, I think it's important uh, in order to understand what happened in Germany, you have to understand not only what happened in Germany, but really what happened in Europe at all. And we had in that time, um, if you look back from uh, 1985, uh, Mr. Gorbachev governing uh, to being the general secretary uh, of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. This was important for us because if you uh, listened or read his speeches, you could understand, understand there's another kind of thinking. Um, he tried to reform communism because he understood that communism in that way he experienced wouldn't survive and wouldn't challenge all these problems of that time. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this was an old nomenclatura, an old-fashioned communist party, and he tried to encourage people um, to change with so-called glasnost and perestroika, uh, transparency and reforms. And so uh, from that time it started that there was a new thinking. There was an understanding of global challenging. There was an understanding uh, of the competition of the two big powers, um, NATO and Warsaw Pact, and especially the leading uh, nations. And so um, there was, in our case, uh, growing awareness that if things will change in our own country, then not again tanks will destroy all of that which happened in 1953, the uprising in East Germany uh, in that time, it was uh, only some weeks after the foundation of GDR uh, in the beginning of the 50s, and um, we know today that um, there were involved uh, almost uh, two million people in 700 uh, cities. Uh, so it was really not only a demonstration in Berlin, which usually uh, people know, but it was really an uprising and the tanks um, destroyed all hopes uh, of the people and similar things happened in Hungary in 56 and uh, you know the uh, socialism with the human, human face, um, the Czech and Slovak um, hopes and perspective in 1986. Uh, and all that experience was that all change will be destroyed um, all hope will be destroyed because tanks uh, were coming uh, and destroyed all these developments. And only in the second uh, half of the 80s, there was a growing hope that that will not happen again. Uh, I belong to what is called usually the opposition in GDR. These were um, groups, um, mostly of them, uh, inside of the churches, uh, because the church uh, was in East Germany, in the communist part of Germany, the only institution uh, which could organize itself in a freely way. Um, we had an elected leadership, we had our own rooms, we had our own communication uh, and education institutions. I myself, for instance, when I, uh, by pressure, uh, lost my place at school, and had to cut my education after the tenth, uh, 10 years of school, I went to the, the school of the church. Uh, and so I finished my uh, studies and studied theology and philosophy, and so 
uh, it, I could have my career uh, inside of the church. And when it became later than in the end of the 80s, uh, when it became foreign minister, um, only that first 10 years of school were acknowledged publicly, official. All this other was not in acknowledged education of that time. That happened in that time, and so you had inside of the church uh, a free communication, a free education, and this uh, is a background uh, why so many uh, clergymen uh, took part uh, and uh, played an important role in the peaceful revolution uh, in East Germany in 89. I can't uh, tell you all that, it would be too long, but uh, it's important to have uh, that framework that on the one hand uh, there was that hope which we had, uh, the hope uh, of Poland, uh, of the Hungarians, uh, that not again tanks will come. And in the years before we thought uh, that it would be a question of if honesty, a question of uh, moral and dignity um, to be in opposition, to, to be engaged, um, to, uh, to say the truth, although uh, it was not uh, wished and you could come under pressure, uh, but it was more a moralistic behavior. Then, in the end of the 80s, we started to hope that really things could be changed. And that's why we started to organize um, organizations outside of the church, because it was clear for us church can't be a structural opposition against the state, uh, and you need a political organization. And so we started, in my case, uh, to found uh, the Social Democratic Party. Others started to have uh, movements, and I think you have got the name of Neues Forum, a uh, new forum. Uh, or the outbreak, uh, democratic outbreak uh, and democratic aufbruch and so, such kind of uh, organizations with fantastic names and <laughs> making clear that there is hope that people will be uh, engaged in coming uh, from the civil society. And I think it, this was an important point for that time that although we had the agreements from the Helsinki process in the 70s, that there was more linkage between East and West, that there was, especially in the third dimension of that uh, Helsinki process, uh, the question of human contact, uh, the question of media, tra more trans transparency, uh, and asking the question of human rights. Uh, this dimension was very important and gave us some space of information, some space of uh, acting, and we could all the time uh, show that the papers of that Helsinki process of uh, KSC, CSE, uh, that, uh, that you have signed it, all these principles, and we tried uh, to involve people uh, to, encar to be encouraged and to demand their own rights. Um, in the end of the 80s, what I mentioned, we uh, founded uh, this party. Uh, it happened in other cases. Uh, in Poland, uh, it started with a round table. Uh, you can call it a negotiated revolution, because uh, the d disaster of the Polish communists was so strong that, and economically, that they couldn't find a way out. And so in the end, under the pressure of the underground Solidarność, uh, they were so much under pressure that they agreed to have a round table with the opposition and the communists. And in the end, they had a half free election. And after that, in summer 89, the first non-communist um, prime minister in Poland was Tadeusz Mazowiecki. And that encouraged us uh, to go forward uh, in the same way uh, in Hungary, they started to open the wall to Austria. Uh, and so people uh, got hope during the summer in East Germany. Uh, we had some tensions in East Germany between that people who only wanted to leave the country because they thought we don't like to live here. And it, there was a wall. It was not po 
po uh, possible legally uh, to go out, but that gave away the Hungarians. Uh, and so during the summer 89, 50,000 people via Budapest uh, left uh, the country. Um, and so there was the other part, the opposition, who tried to convince the others, stay here and fight together with us for change. And so there was some tension, but in the end, um, all these different groups in, in the population, uh, it came together, and so it was possible um, to convince people to go to the streets, and that uh, thousands and thousands came. And we founded this party, so you had leadership. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people making uh, pressure, and so we were successful. In October, um, we succeeded that it was very important day, the 9th of October. November came later, uh, as usual in, in the year. Uh, uh, so uh, the 9th of October was, was a special date because in Leipzig there was a big demonstration of 70,000 people. And uh, the communists were prepared uh, to uh, have Violet, to sh um, with Violet and with military, uh, to prevent and to push them away. I experienced it in Magdeburg with uh, 10,000 people in the, uh, around the Magdeburg uh, church, the main church there, the Magdeburg Dome. Uh, and it was very interesting that I experienced that day in the evening, two days before we had uh, founded uh, the Social Democratic Party and I gave the information there in public. Uh, and then um, we had in the end of that such kind of meetings um, a public prayer. And so a young man came with a candle and said, I wish and ask God um, not to meet my father today again. And we were very astonished, why? And then he told, my father is outside with that uh, weaponed military troops. And if he would meet, it would be a bloodshed. Uh, and so uh, it was a very emotional uh, situation. And it succeeded. Uh, it happened uh, in that day, and from that 9th of October, we were in the uh, opposition groups, uh, we were personally sure, there was no guarantee, but we personally were sure uh, that we will succeed with democracy. Uh, and uh, then uh, we worked for that, we prepared uh, what was to do for establishment, uh, free elections, and so on. Um, and then, we prepared the round table, similar as in Poland, uh, which it happened before in Hungary too. And so we prepared how to establish democracy. Uh, and it needed the pressure from the, from the people on the streets. Every week, thousands and thousands of people uh, went to the street to demand uh, freedom and democracy. Uh, and then there was a misunderstanding because the Communist Party the, in the end of 9th of November, they had decided this day um, a new bill about traveling. Uh, this was not a sp really special thing because we had the disadvantage um, to other communist countries in which it was possible you had got in Hungary and Poland the right to travel. Every two years, uh, whatever, uh, to, could travel to the Western countries. And so they decided, they were under, under pressure with all the demonstrations, they tried to took the initiative um, to get uh, the way and the policy in, his, in their hands. And so they decided that bill for traveling. And uh, Mr. Shabowski, in this press conference, I think the most of you have seen uh, uh, the photos and uh, the films about that, uh, the video, he answered when he was asked when it is possible to do so, and he said immediately. Uh, but the misunderstanding was that it was not opening the war. It was only giving everybody the right, as usual in other countries, uh, to go with application, and after that, everybody will get uh, the, the allowance, how to, uh, visa. Uh, the visa uh, to go out. And so, uh, but people, after that demonstrations, you have to be aware, every week thousands and thousands um, went to the street with demonstrations. And so people went to the wall 
And thousands and thousands came, and from that pressure, they opened the ball and went through. And there was not a uh, shot, uh, because the days before, they didn't shoot two, uh, the military troops. And from that behavior, uh, there, uh, they were, had got that feeling that shooting is not allowed for them. Um, because they had, during the weeks before, since the 9th of October, uh, that behavior of all that military troops and uh, troops of security not to shoot. Um, I think this is only the only understanding in which way uh, it happened. And then, from the 9th of uh, November, the wall uh, was open. Not really, because it was a mixture then. You could go and then they, they controlled you in the next weeks. Uh, but from December, uh, it was really uh, open in the end. And uh, so all the whole world saw this. Um, and so it is a symbol. Uh, this day is a symbol of the end of the Cold War. And I think it is important to understand, I call that event um, the, the storm of the Bastille, of the revolution, uh, peaceful revolution in Central Europe. Because it happened as a result of the revolution. This peaceful revolution in GDR happened in the framework of the Central European um, happenings since the beginning of 89 in Poland, Hungary, later in Czechoslovakia. So in the end, it was a Central European uh, revolution, and the symbol for all of them is the fall of the war. I think it is important to have that understanding, and then to understand that this peaceful revolution, this victory of freedom, uh, pushed away not only the wall, but also the borders. Um, and started uh, the opportunity uh, for unification. Uh, I think this is important that freedom at first and only then the process of negotiations, the process uh, of unification uh, could take place and not only the German one but also the European one. Um, I can't tell you all of that but I think it's to have that understanding that peaceful Victory of freedom, so first step. The second step is uh, negotiations. Um, after that so-called negotiated revolution in Poland with a round table, um, not uh, to violate uh, uh, the others too, although they were as communists our enemies. Uh, but we sat uh, together with them uh, to find a resolution in order to get a free election, and they wouldn't accept us on the table if they were not the thousands of people in the streets. Both belonged together. We only could act as that uh, leading organizations or parties at the same time to having that backing uh, from the thousands uh, of people. Only together uh, could uh, bring us to that uh, success. And <coughs> so, uh, we succeeded uh, on the one hand uh, to have the round table to have the con to clarify the conditions uh, for the free election and then we got the free election in East Germany with the free election uh, a legitimized uh, government uh, a free elected parliament and so negotiations could be done between both German states um, and then in the international framework with two plus four. Uh, I served then as one of the two, together with Mr. Genscher, uh, as a two German uh, foreign ministers, and then with the allies of the Second World War, uh, with Mr. Baker, uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger, uh, Mr. Hurt from Great Britain, and Mr. Dumas uh, from France. These were uh, the six that we negotiated and came to an end during a very short time. I, in the beginning, didn't think that it would be possible in such a short time. Um, Mr. de Maizière, the prime minister in our government, uh, in his uh, first speech in the parliament said that he will hope that uh, after two years, we will, three years, we will have um, the first common uh, delegation to the next Olympic Games. 
after three years. The end was that after half a year, we had the unification. And so you see uh, that dynamic process uh, in that time. But then dynamic came from the people. Um, and I, when I had my first talk um, with Mr. Shevardnadze, I brought him uh, to Moscow three messages. First is, we are not the young brother getting demands, getting demands and orders. We wouldn't accept it. Uh, we are free elected now, and we are a sovereign state uh, for you. Second is, unification will come. Unification will come. You won't uh, prevent it, whatever you do. Uh, you won't uh, prevent it because people really uh, would like to have it. And uh, if we wouldn't follow that way, uh, we would be pushed away. Uh, it was very clear that the population of East Germany wanted to have unification. And that's why this was our, after the election, this was our aim, this was our goal, that was that what we had to organize as a government. Uh, and I think it is not usual that a government has uh, the first goal uh, to resolve themselves. Because unification meant uh, that it was clear that after that only one government uh, will be there. And in the end of that process, we had uh, the federal election uh, of Germany. And so that all belonged uh, together, and we succeeded. It was not so easy. Um, because the third point, uh, that was a question of the conditions, and that meant um, that German sovereignty ought to be established. Uh, we, we had the, uh, the rights of the allies of the Second World War for Germany as a whole. Uh, and especially in Berlin. Berlin was not sovereign, uh, including the governor here. Uh, and so, and the mayor, and it was very clear this had to be resolved to get a really united sovereign uh, state, and we needed the acceptance for that. But the people didn't understand. The people didn't understand. We negotiated in that time, we negotiated the, um, the treaty about the currency, which started in July. Uh, we started in, the, in July uh, with um, unity, uh, negotiations about the treaty about unification, and we started in May um, with the first round uh, of two plus four. But the 17th of June, we had it was a national day, the Remembrance Day of that uprising of 53, which was the national day of West, western part of Germany all the time. Um, and then we had that uh, Remembrance Day in East Germany. Uh, and that day we had to have a meeting of the parliament uh, because it was a very busy time. We had a celebration, uh, a special act, and after that, uh, our meeting. And then a um, group, uh, which was not so disciplined at that time, uh, of the Christian Democrats, uh, VSU, and some of the uh, left party, um, the Greens, uh, to today they are Greens, um, with Mr. Ullmann, they brought two motions to the parliament for immediate access to the Federal Republic of Germany. We, we, did finish, uh, we didn't finish the negotiation. Um, and it was really a very difficult situation to prevent that we voted about that. Because it was very clear in that day, because we had the um, remembrance uh, meeting in the, in the morning, Mr. Kohl, Genscher, and all these uh, guys uh, sat there. Uh, and in that situation, uh, the majority, in my view, was very clear if we would vote these motions. And we prevented it. We prevented it and brought it to the commission. And so we could continue with negotiation. Imagine that we didn't succeed with that, uh, wie sagt man, uh, managing uh, of the procedure. Uh, because if we wouldn't succeed with that, we would, as government, go home as citizens of the Federal Republic of Germany, resolving our government. And Mr. Kohl, at the same time, had been chancellor of the United Germany, because this voting 
had been the implemented decision of unification without any clarified condition, without any finished uh, negotiation, including all these issues uh, of two plus four, question of alliance, and all these problems. Um, I think it is, I give that example because um, it gives an, a picture about that dynamic situation, about the pressure of the people, including the parliamentarians. And so they were not really interested in our negotiations. They wanted unification immediately. And they thought if we get unification immediately, if we get the currency, Denmark, immediately, then we would get welfare immediately. Uh, this was a thinking, it seemed to be a little bit naive, and it was, but it was reality, that thinking. And so the pressure was uh, very high uh, for us in that negotiations, and that speeded up uh, the situation and the process uh, of unification. We succeeded because Gorbachev, in the end, <coughs> accepted um, NATO membership and the full sovereignty of Germany, including NATO membership of the United uh, Germany, after the Congress of the Communist Party in the end of June. Uh, this was a difficult time because he was, he himself was very much under pressure uh, in his own country, uh, and it was not really clear would he survive that party congress. After he passed it, then he could implement what he promised in the end of May before uh, to Mr. Bush Sr., um, in which he accepted sovereignty and NATO membership in the end of May uh, before. And so he implemented it with the first Western um, politician, and this was Mr. Cole in Caucasus, and so uh, we could finish uh, that process. There's another story with the border. Um, with the German-Polish border, but we can uh, come back to that. So in the end, um, I think it was a marvelous uh, process for Germany, and it was important not only for Germany, but for Europe as a whole, uh, because it was important for um, Hungary, it was important for Poland, uh, that they said, we need a united Germany, the Democrats there thought in that way. We need the United Germany uh, in order to get NATO and EU as neighbor, in order to get membership in the future. And so, at the same time, they tried to get um, a member of the Western institutions. I think, uh, in the end, that was a crucial process, not only of uniting Germany, but also of uniting Europe. Uh, it was a completion of Europe. It was not really enlargement, uh, because it was clear that time, because of the Cold War, was not possible that this, that former Eastern countries could take part in that integration process. And they started to do so, and I think it's a marvelous success uh, that we, in the end, uh, succeeded uh, in 2004 and 2007 with Romania and Bulgaria um, to have that membership on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, to have that process of uh, <coughs> process of stronger and deeper integration with the Constitution. Um, and then we failed because France and Netherlands, and you all know that process, uh, but in the end, now we have the Lisbon Treaty, which is a, which is a, a crucial point. I think um, that this is a very important um, not only German part of uh, history, but also uh, European one. And it was important um, for us that um, we, as Germans, had in the background the history of democratization and dealing with our own past. And I think it's a crucial point um, that Germany got international accepting, acceptance because West Germany accepted uh, the responsibility of its own past, of Holocaust, and all that was terrible uh, happened uh, from Germany towards the uh, whole of Europe. Uh, and that 
in society and in the state, there was a dealing with that. Not only feeling guilty, but also taking that responsibility of, especially of people who are not personally involved. If you see, for instance, uh, that marvelous uh, event 40 years ago, uh, that a German chancellor with Willy Brandt, that a German chancellor who was an immigrant, he fought against Hitler. He personally had no reason uh, to ask for forgiveness because he, together with the allies, with other enemies of Hitler, fought against him. But he took his office going to Poland and was kneeling there in the monument uh, of the uprising of Jewish people uh, in the ghetto in Warsaw. I think this, this photo, I think all of you know uh, that photo, that was a very important issue, not only for Germany, but for the whole, but for the whole world to understand that there are people uh, who understand their responsibility um, for Europe uh, and for the neighbors. The communists, the GDR, didn't do so. They felt as victors of the Second World War because they were communists, and which really the, the communists and the leading, the leading communists really too fought against Hitler. Konecker was in the, uh, in, the, in the prison all the time, uh, and many communists were in the concentration camps. But they brought East Germany to the communist world, and they gave the impression for all East Germans that they are not guilty. Uh, when they established the wall in 61, um, they gave the name that anti-fascistic war. That has the fascists are in the West, and the good people uh, together with the Soviets uh, going to the future uh, are not guilty in the East. And so, um, this we changed immediately after the free election in 1990. Uh, and then we made a declaration in which we accepted our responsibility, uh, which belonged uh, to our past and which is important for the future. I think this was a crucial point for us. And so uh, on the one, uh, one hand, the West Germany had decades, four decades of a stabilizing democracy. Uh, and an experienced democracy then, and we, with a peaceful revolution, and knowing our responsibility, that both gave us that acceptance, not only of the former allies, but also of the neighbors. And for that, it was important to accept the border with Poland. It was a crucial point, and I was sometimes a little bit, not only a little bit, uh, <laughs> really angry with Mr. Kohl. He was not so clear in the beginning. Uh, in that question uh, of the border. And there was another point of that declaration which changed in Germany the Jewish community. Uh, because we invited, as in East Germany, we invited Jewish people in Soviet Union who were there under pressure. And because they were uh, under pressure, we invited them to come to East Germany. Um, the Federal Republic of uh, Government of Germany was not so happy about that, but we did. Uh, and the government refused to bring that invitation into the unification treaty. But in the end, they continued that. And the following is, uh, and the impact is uh, that now we have uh, up to 2005, 200 and 20,000 Jewish people from all countries of the former Soviet Union coming to Germany. And so we have a really completely changed, but more uh, crowded uh, Jewish community uh, in Germany. I would like um, to come back to the question of human rights, which is an in, uh, in important point, because I really think that we have to learn, and you mentioned it before, the question of democracy. Our experience is that democracy cannot be established from outside. Um, it was very important that um, we had the framework, the framework 
uh, of Western countries, um, especially uh, with the Helsinki process, uh, giving us opportunity to have contracts with the West, to be so supportive from there. But in the end, I would say, it, the end of the Cold War was not the victory of the West against the East. It was the victory of the values, uh, which especially people, people in East some part of Europe, including East Germany, we had that success and victory because we shared the values with the West. And it is important, that wording, because if it had been a victory of the West against the East, it would include the people and their self-understanding that they are they defeated at that time. But exactly the opposite is the case. And the people in East Germany, um, they had the success because they trusted and they fought <coughs> in the end uh, for freedom and democracy, and they succeeded uh, with that sharing uh, that common values uh, with the West. And so I think this has the effect for the future, uh, how to deal with authoritarian states. In my view, it is important uh, that we, in every case, have to invest in that people in these countries who would like to fight for democracy and freedom, who are ready uh, to do something there. And so our investment is to support and give assistance to civil society, to give assistance to democratic uh, opposition. This is a crucial point for every change, and in my view, a very important uh, condition uh, for uh, every change. It could be that it's not a sufficient uh, condition, and it happened that sometimes, if you see Iran uh, last year, uh, that it is not succeeding. But uh, it is important that change only can be done. There are some other things in the framework of the f question of power, the question of the international security, question of neighbors, and all this uh, has to be included. But I think an important point is uh, that there has to be a part of the population which is sharing the values, which is uh, which we can do much, in my view, uh, to support um, such people in these countries. And besides this, we should be in dialogue uh, with the governing and official institutions, um, but not one uh, or the other. Uh, as usual, we in European Union, for instance, if you see the Belarus uh, strategy or Cuba strategy, very often we are doing the one or the other. Uh, and if it's a common uh, standpoint of the European Union towards Cuba from the 90s is saying uh, that we ask for democracy and limit the contracts uh, to the officials. In my view, we had in every case we have to support opposition and democratic um, powers in that country. And bes besides that, if they are ready to have contact with the officials uh, and doing uh, such things uh, to convince them, to tell them the truth and our opinion, but on the other hand, to give them uh, some pressure and dialogue. And so you can see, similar as it uh, was done by the West uh, in the Helsinki process, uh, with economic cooperation, some things uh, can change too. There's another um, field I wanted, but I can't really uh, add about the question of uh, minorities. I think really that is a, a crucial point. Um, I personally experienced it when I was first time uh, as a young student in Transylvania. Um, where I had uh, the experience with German minority far away to find German minority. It was really a very um, emotional um, experience for me. But on the other hand, see there uh, that there was a Hungarian uh, German minority, uh, many Roma, and the uh, situation of Ceausescu. <coughs> with all the difficulties, uh, it 
it was a very interesting experience for me. And uh, having that in background, I experienced in 1989 um, a meeting, an assembly of churches in Basel. It was the first time the churches, Catholic uh, and Protestant churches, met at one place uh, in spring 89 in Basel to the assembly of churches for justice um, and peace. And there it was amazing to see that people from, you could have the impression, living in different centuries. Um, a, a young priest from Netherlands with jeans, and then on the other hand from the Orthodox Church. And you could think that's the that's Middle Age um, in the, the whole delegation. But they all came together and talked about and talked about the future uh, in that assembly. It was that the question of minorities is only the question of Eastern Europe. And I didn't uh, agree with that, because if you see Ireland, uh, Basque, and so on, you see other countries too with uh, the West and with their difficulties. But it was clear, and that's why in the 19th it was changed, that Europe was not really prepared in that, uh, in that point. Europe was not prepared and had to make clear what does it mean that the rights of minorities. And so um, the and convention about uh, human rights, the uh, European, uh, was, was changed and added with a question uh, of minorities, which in my view uh, is really a crucial point. And I myself uh, made the proposal uh, last year after uh, the European election that in my view it would be good that um, if the European Commission would establish a commission of our minorities because we have now, this Lisbon Treaty, good regulations by law. But the question of implementation, uh, of awareness, what does it mean to care for the rights of minorities, uh, there's, uh, in my view, a big uh, gap and lack. And uh, what, happened, what happens now in France uh, is only an uh, example um, about that. Uh, I personally think, for instance, that it is, uh, had to be prevented that uh, Roma, in Germany too, uh, would brought back uh, by pressure to Kosovo, because the situation in Kosovo is not right. Uh, it's not a, a good prepared uh, for that. And so I think this is another field uh, which uh, would be uh, very important. The last point I uh, would like to mention is the question of dealing with the past. Uh, I really think, I mentioned it before, that it was, in my view, a precondition of acceptance of Germany that we dealt um, with our uh, past in the National Socialism uh, time. And we started after unification, and not only after, in the f time of the free elected parliament, we start with dealing with the communist past too. We established, it was mentioned in, when you presented my uh, biography, um, I made the proposal in the 90s and we um, established a commission uh, over two periods uh, in the parliament about dealing with that past and, and the effects of that past. And I really am convinced that it is important to deal especially with injustice and problems in our past because only from that we get and we become sensible about problems, uh, about violations of human rights, who, which are not happening far away, and we can see it in TV. There is another sensibility if we see that we ourselves are affected, that our families, our fathers, our parents, were involved, then we can ask, how could it happen? How could it happen? What could be done in a society dealing with people who are different, people uh, who are with other ethnic roots? All this, in my view, is a crucial point uh, for a democratic country to get involved because democracy and the question of human rights is not only a question of structures, it's a question of a political uh, culture and it 
it is very important that we ha get it in our minds, that we get it in our uh, dialogues uh, in the society with support of the state that this kind of dealing with the past uh, is going on and uh, saying that because uh, we are together here, I belong to that people um, in 1995 who promoted and pushed it very much, uh, that motion in the German Bundestag about the Armenian genocide. Uh, because I think we personally, we as Germans, for instance, took part in that. We were part, uh, we were allies in the first, uh, the first World War. Uh, we were allies and our diplomats and our military persons uh, were in the, it was not Turkey, the current Turkey, it was the Osman uh, Empire uh, in that time and all these knowledge came to Germany. And there was, for instance, one German pastor uh, who made that public and published it and uh, made a book and sent it to every parliamentarian and by the German uh, police, it was prevented that the parliamentarians got that papers, and they got it only two years later, uh, after uh, the uh, First World War. And so I think it is important that we, our own history, deal with that very transparent and very openly, and only then we can solve and um, conciliate uh, situations with our neighbors. We had the discussions about past, including the last uh, months and years uh, between Germany and Poland, for instance. Uh, that's another issue. But uh, I can tell you that I'm really convinced that that questions of dealing with own past, on the one hand, the question of human rights and sensibility, um, and to establish an international legal system in which it, uh, we can make strong uh, that human rights uh, have to be protected, uh, that's crucial. And the last sentence is, that's not only the question of states, it's not only the question of structures, it's a question of engaged people, it's a question of engaged civil society pushing it making it public, uh, pushing their own parties, their own governments, in order to make transparent and public uh, where people uh, are violated in their personal dignity and in their uh, rights. And I think exactly that is a challenge for all of us. We never will have a situation in our states uh, in which it can't happen. It can happen because we are people and we are ourselves able to fail, as very often we do. And so it's important that there's a transparent situation, that there's a civil society fighting for the dignity of the people. And we, when we 20 years ago got German unification, one reason, one motivation was that the article, the first article, in the German constitution, the basic law is that we have to protect the human dignity of every person. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for, I think, uh, one of the most exciting speeches uh, that we've heard, and I think on such a historic time uh, to have had this speech here in the city uh, on this date uh, really has, I think, historic significance. So thank you very, very much. Uh, if it's okay with you, we'll have a yes. few questions and comments from, from the audience. If you're not hungry. Please, please hey. raise your hand. <laughs> briefly introduce yourself, and I would say let's limit it maybe to one question to each person to try to allow for as many voices as possible. Uh, I think you were the first. Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, hearing the peaceful uh, revolution and German reunification. Myself, I come from South and Southeast Asia. We were divided during colonial period uh, under the administrative provincial administration. Uh, at that time, Burma, Assam, and Bengal. So the British themselves tried to put us together again in their 
Historic Jin Lusay Conference 1892 in Calcutta. But they keep painting because of the communication and others uh, oh, and so many things. But our area had been uh, administered under Foreign Jurisdiction Act in its area. And we have got these uh, Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulations to protect others from entering to our uh, country. Though we are uh, under the administrative, some portion in uh, India and some portion in uh, Bangladesh and some portion in Burma. And we are uh, in a contiguous area. And we are fighting this, uh, our unification for the last 118 years, but not yet <laughs> completed. So when we are thinking of this ICD inviting us to uh, attend in, the, in this meeting, and we admire the German peoples who had a peaceful revolution and German reunification has been attained which had been divided in 18, uh, sorry, in 1945, after, uh, uh, after 50 years. But the same people had divided the Zhou people 50 years ahead of the German division. But we have still fighting, not yet succeed. So I want to know how also we are going to about to have a peaceful revolution and reunification of Zhao people could come out. That is why we like to hear very much what type of things we have to uh, follow in fo so that the Zhao people may also reunify under one administrative head. That is my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, or better is to collect some. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay, I think you're next. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Laura Biagioni. I come from Italy. And uh, I wanted to tell you that I, absolute, I'm, I agree absolutely about the issue that uh, uh, Germany did an um, admission of responsibility about uh, what in the Second World War ha was happening. Things that in Italy, in my point of view, do didn't didn't happen otherwise we wouldn't have the situation that uh, we have at the moment but i also realized living in germany since uh, some years that there are some movi some movements okay um, that uh, try to make uh, a kind of propaganda okay from of uh, this uh, um, neo nazis idea and um, i'm sure that uh, there has been uh, some um, energy is put uh, to avoid that something was uh, happening again, like uh, what was happening. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there are some exponents, uh, not just from the NPD, but uh, there is uh, um, some movements uh, that are more located in uh, East Berlin, okay, we need just to go to Lichtenberg, uh, Marzahn, um, and uh, this kind of area where there is still this kind of propaganda and I would like to know if there is uh, some social project or or um, because this for sure is a lack of uh, uh, of culture in, in the young people okay if there is uh, some social project uh, to avoid uh, that this kind of propaganda is going on because actually there are na Nazi demonstration there are people going in the street and making demos uh, with the uh, um, with the Nazi Kreuz, uh, um, cross, uh, um, and whatever. So this is my question. I, I'm really wondering about this. How is mm -hmm. possible? Mm -hmm. Is there a third question? Okay. Yes, my name is Darnell Summers, and I'm associated, affiliated with the ICD. Uh, it's not just a question of neo-Nazis and right-wing groups organized here. Since the fall of the wall, there have been almost 100 people who have been killed, murdered by these right-wing forces. And the overwhelming majority of them have been people of African descent. Now, if we, we've, you've covered the, some of the uh, situation before the fall of the wall, and even um, His Excellency, Excellency uh, Mr. Tax has talked about um, Turkey beginning to examine the past, 
1980 and before and the excesses of the military government. But what, to what extent at this particular time do we know the identity of the people who have killed oh, almost 100 people, if not more? And I think that if we talk about human rights and we talk about some form of democracy, then within that, there must be some struggle, some movement to arrive at justice for the people who have been murdered. Now, just, I'm gonna keep my, my comment brief. Um, there is a hotel here in Berlin, and they put on a show, and I'm from Detroit, and a friend of mine came over to sing at this hotel. And she was given a Befauge Carta, a, B, C. That means there's a, there's a A region, a B zone, and a C zone. She was told in no uncertain terms, she's a black woman, that she was not to go into the C zone. And so, I mean, there are people here who live under that pressure. They live under the pressure of constant attack from fascists, Nazi, right wing, whatever you want to call them, forces. And that's a reality. And as I said before, people have died. We need to, and I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that you're responsible for that. That's, that would be ridiculous. And I think that everyone here is for human rights. So I, I want to make that clear. But I think that we have to draw attention to that. And some action must be taken to clarify that issue. I can't give you a clear explanation. But I can tell you that that happened starting during the demonstrations for freedom. I have a friend, he comes from Mozambique. He lived in East Germany. Uh, because the communists invited people from different countries to work and to get educated. Uh, and at the same time, they uh, tried to influence them uh, with that communist ideology. And they lived in uh, East Germany. But they lived there um, more in a ghetto, not really with good contact in the population. And so, um, we got the impression in the 80s, in the end of the 80s, that there is uh, some uh, pressure against such people. Um, and uh, I started in a church, I had uh, such a seminar, I shared uh, it close to Magdeburg. I started with that issue, uh, a group dealing with that uh, problems. And uh, I invited them uh, it was that time of uh, changing in the autumn of 89. And we made a seminar, and they told me that these black people, too, came to the demonstrations fighting for freedom. And the same, at the same time, they were pushed away, they were, were oppressed during the demonstrations. And exactly that's a problem, that people, and that's not only in East Germany the case, that people who feel free have to learn that freedom not only means my own, but also means to accept the tolerance and tolerance the dignity of the others too. That's why I think it was very important um, to establish structures not only of personal freedom, but structures of right, structures of in a legal uh, situation with the rule of law. Uh, and this is what people never learned in the communist time. In communist time, it is a part of the ideology, of the communist ideology, that law is an instrument of, a, of the governing elite. And you can use it. 
And it was interesting in thinking that um, people um, who were lawyers, uh, that they made a declaration in autumn 89. They made a declaration and wanted to show that they are now not for the communists, but now for democracy. And so they made a declaration saying, now we would like to use a right in favor of democracy. They didn't understand that a right is not an instrument to be used for anything other. Uh, that right uh, is a question uh, of managing different interests by clear procedures. That right is giving everybody uh, the same dignity and the same uh, opportunities in society and so on. This is a um, real deep problem in the society and it's very difficult uh, to overcome it, especially if people, if you have, I, I can't describe it as a reason, but I think it's influencing it. If you have an unemployment rate of more than 20%, uh, in some areas more than 30. Uh, if you have uh, desperation between people, although it's their welfare is better than before, but they are feeling not accepted in the society. There are in East Germany many who are feeling uh, being second class citizen uh, in the society although it's not right in my view, but we have to take it serious that there is such feeling. Um, I, I can add some things more, I, but I can't really describe uh, why uh, it happens. Uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, it would, would, wouldn't like uh, to mention that similar things are happening all over Europe. I know, and you know that it's uh, happening. Um, but and on the other hand, uh, what I mentioned with dealing with the past uh, in GDR, in the communist time, it was every time clear that the communists were against uh, that dictatorship. But there was no uh, dealing in the education about own involvement. Exactly that was not the case. People were acknowledged as belonging to the victors of the Second World War because we are a communist society and communism uh, is representing the future and anticipating the future. And so uh, dealing with uh, prejudice, dealing uh, with differences in a society, all that was never learned. Um, in a communist uh, society. And so uh, it's very difficult to learn that society is not black or white, that usually human life is different degrees of gray. Another point that compromise is a crucial point of human being and human life and behavior. Uh, and not, nobody is possessing the truth. All this is it with the background of communism, uh, which has to get learned uh, and which has to get experienced in your own communication. And this is what we have to do. Um, the question uh, of India, I can't solve that problem, really. Uh, I think there are some criteria uh, which we experienced 20 years ago, that it was crucial to go a nonviolent way. That was crucial for the acceptance in the end. Um, the second point is um, that it needs not only a minority following their own aims. I am sometimes 
doubting that that willingness of being independent is really the willing of the majority of that population. Uh, I have some doubts about that and sometimes I think it's a question of a part of good educated fighting elites but uh, people like to live in welfare. People like to live in acceptance of their special identities. And that's not a question of uh, independent states. It's a question of minority rights. It's a question, could be a question of autonomy. There are different legal opportunities uh, which could be found in a state. And it, it is needed uh, to bring people uh, fighting for that in a peaceful way. This was our experience, and I think uh, that it will be crucial that the way and the instruments are really non-violent. Yes, this was a similar question. I can't uh, answer in a special way, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, should we take maybe one more round of questions? Uh, yes. I guess we'll start in the front, maybe. My question is just to, to help the ICD regarding the question of the Zoo Brother. I think the ICD is an institute of uh, cultural democracy, uh, uh, diplomacy. And uh, it is not the job or uh, task to deal with the problem of uh, unification of uh, the people of your country or I don't know whatever it is. But uh, since uh, you started to ask the same question from the beginning up to now, and I think the ICD was not able to tell him that this is not the forum where he will find a question to his problem. I think they take it into account. It's, uh, register somewhere that there is such issues and probably at the level, at the higher level, they will find uh, the right forum where these kind of issues can be resolved. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comment. And we'll, we'll discuss this actually tomorrow also in terms of the future, because we actually, the Institute would actually very much like to get involved and support a number of initiatives. Uh, but I'd suggest let's keep the, the questions focused for Mr. Michael for now, but thank you, thank you for the response. And again, if you could please briefly introduce yourself, Elsa. Uh, hello, my name is Victor Melendez, and I'm from Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So, I I wanted to say something about the so, something that I, what I found, what I have observed in this Congress. We've been always talking about the relationship between democracy and the human the human rights that. That is obviously very important because the human rights are philosophically structured to protect us from ourselves, basically. <laughs> so, but I, I want to, to appoint something. We are always talking about democracy as, as an important actor, but democracy is actually a tool, a tool that respond to, to a higher to a higher center of organization. It is is one kind of political organization to a territory, but it is strictly uh, related to the system organization of nation state. And what I'm talking about nation state is the the structure of a system to dominate or make a stand on a certain uh, level, on a delimited uh, territory, and it is a force that includes some and also excludes some. I, I don't know if I'm making this clear, but this, the, the nation state is obviously a tool that uh, um, organize the world in order to exclude somebody. And how we can conciliate a system that is built on that basis to respect the human rights 
in, in, in a universal level? That, that's what I'm asking. Okay, though we can go to the philosophical seminar, <laughs> but Take it's very important. Okay. Hi, my name is Janessa Dax, and I'm, um, my background is actually in education, and that's something that I'd like to uh, maybe have addressed. Um, what role did education play in the sort of the peaceful revolution and reunification? Because I think um, that's, I think the next generation is very important in this whole story. So. Okay, um, Peter Kirschleger from the Center for Human Rights Education, Lucerne, Switzerland. My question would actually be in addition to your question and the question from you in the sense that I would be wondering, as you're also a politician, uh, my impression is that this problem we have in Europe in general, not just in Germany, you know, about right-wing movements which are really very powerful and a threat to a certain amount of our populations, um, if this not has also to do, you know, when you were talking about your experience, you were kind of saying, well, you know, the external contracts you could refer to or certain kind of structures where you could meet, like the churches, were important for your movement. What I see from my practice is that we have like right-wing organizations which are very well organized. They can work on long-term um, goals. They work for 10, 20 years with strategies. And on the other hand, we have people fighting these movements which have to fight for project-funded money like for three years and then have to evaluate after two years to get another funding which they don't receive. So kind of, you know, fighting with different kind of arms in parentheses. So my question would be if that wouldn't be possible to do with your experience, with your weight um, as a politician, to start something which really could on the European level improve the structure and the contracts which in movements which try to fight racism, discrimination on a European level could have a better context to do that. Thanks. Final, final question. Thank you. My name is Mattima Grassi. I come from Italy, uh, postdoc researcher at the University of Trento. And my question deals with the uh, approach of uh, Germany to its role on the global scenario and European integration 20 years after unification. I'm saying this because uh, coming here on the plane, I read a commentary on a major uh, Italian newspaper saying very briefly that uh, the wall was not only an, ins an instrument of division between, uh, uh, but served as a sort of mirror in which both parties of Europe could see the, their European identity. This was true for Germans also, uh, but also for um, all the peoples living not only in the western side of the wall, but also for Hungarians, for people in Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria. And uh, that 20 years later, this is not true anymore. That uh, the nation state is uh, uh, in playing a big role uh, again, uh, and this is true for the political crisis of the European Union. And uh, the commentary was very provocative against, for example, the, uh, the demand of Germany of a permanent seat in the Security Council that is, uh, is considered an evidence of uh, a new approach as a nation state and uh, uh, again in opposition to a, an approach to uh, European integration. I wanted you, if you mm -hmm. can comment on this. Thank you. So it's a pity for you, you will die or uh, will not get uh, anything to eat because <laughs> <laughs> because if I would like uh, ought really to respond to all these questions uh, it will be uh, three other lectures uh, and uh, especially the last one is alone two uh, of them um, but I will try uh, to shorten it a little bit though at midnight we can finish <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> the question um, of democracy. I think really uh, that's a very crucial point um, because it's a question of inclusion and participation. 
that that's what you what I understood uh, what uh, your point was. Uh, I would say that democracy is always a legal structure for dealing with different interests and give them a clear procedure and regulations. Uh, and because legal framework in every case means a limited, because accepted from a special population, a special um, part of the world, uh, accepted legal framework, which includes everybody and gives everybody the same rights. Um, and, the, and we have that limitation as a precondition, because we can't make our principles as a general principle for all of the world. That's the first point. So the question is, uh, it includes everybody in, uh, uh, inner, uh, in the inner uh, room, uh, but it excludes for that legal framework all that who are not citizens. Um, that's not, not mean citizens, not living in. That's a difference. It's a difference. And for instance, when uh, we had 10 years ago uh, a new president, uh, Johannes Rau, when he became president, and he made in his first speech, he um, related uh, himself to that first article in the Constitution saying, it's the human dignity and that and not only the dignity of citizens that meant in that time because of that problems you mentioned that everybody who is living here has to be accepted with the same dignity also he's only seeking for instance for asylum uh, or he has a different status uh, of living here that's a crucial point uh, and it was a step forward, for instance, that the, our new uh, president today uh, put that point because his speech today uh, in that um, anniversary speech was about integration because that is a crucial point for our society today. Um, and not only for our German, but also our European, uh, as I think. Um, so that's the first point. Inclusion is not the question that others are expelled, but in every case, legal framework is a special and a limited one uh, all over uh, the world. The second point for democracy is the question of rule of law. Uh, and not what I mentioned before, that law and right is not an instrument uh, for a third uh, goal. I think that's a crucial point for understanding uh, law uh, and democracy. And then democracy is not only a legal framework, is not only a regulation uh, of laws, of procedures uh, to deal with different interests and so on. It is also a political culture. And that's the most difficult, that people have to learn it uh, to deal with that. And that is it what I mentioned before, the question of tolerance, the question of acceptance of the dignity of other people, the ability uh, for dialogue, the ability to find uh, consensus or agreements uh, by um, compromises. Uh, if you come from the, for instance, from the communist background, the ideology is that you have to learn the truth, which is fixed, and all other people think in another way, they are wrong. And you have, on the one hand, to convince them or oppress them. That's quite another behavior. Uh, and that is the long and ongoing uh, effort we have to have, have to do uh, for education, as uh, one of you mentioned that uh, education is a crucial point which is not ended 
uh, whenever. Um, but because again and again, uh, we have to learn exactly that. Um, and that's only if a civil society, if a public, uh, is there controlling each other, raising issues each other, violating human rights. If state is violating human rights too, uh, the, the origin of human rights is against the state. Uh, that the state is not allowed um, to violate, uh, violate the rights uh, of the people. But at the same time, it, uh, it is that no, nobody in the state uh, has that right. So I think um, this is the point. Democracy can only be established for a special entity, but democracy promotion, that means that that values, that that understanding uh, has via dialogue, via communication, via support, which for people who are convinced in that, it can only develop in that way, giving a framework, giving space for people who are engaged in that way, fighting in authoritarian or dictatorships uh, for that. And the question is, how do we deal uh, with people who come to our country? And then it is the same. We have to behave them as human beings with the same rights, including that it could be the suspicion that they're terrorists. And so it's a very difficult field. Uh, we go there with uh, Guantanamo, with uh, Abu Ghraib. Um, the, it means that everybody has the right uh, for legal structures at the court uh, to be uh, not only to be attacked, but to protect uh, himself, to get a lawyer, and so on. All these uh, belongs to acceptance of rule of law and acceptance of the dignity of other people, although they are really quite other than uh, me. Um, the question of EU context against uh, extremism. Uh, I'm not so sure that this at first is a question of uh, European Union. It could be that European Union uh, can help uh, to give some money uh, for that, such kind of campaign. But my experience is, for instance, that uh, if you see only Germany, uh, we have in Brandenburg, uh, since the beginning, the state Brandenburg, uh, from the beginning of the 90s, a program uh, for such kind of education, how to deal with uh, extremists, uh, with people to learn democracy. Um, because it is not, you can't fight extremism. If you see extremism, it's a long time before. You have uh, to ask what are people behaving if they experience extremism? Uh, do they look away? Um, do they run away? Uh, let they do or try they uh, to intervene? Or are they applauding their inner um, if such things are happening? Uh, and this question, how to deal with different ethnics, how to deal with different behavior and religion, uh, how to behave towards minorities, what kind of minorities uh, it is, is not only ethnic one. Uh, all this belongs uh, to that ed kind of education. And uh, I think that we have, in, for instance, in Brahmuk, some good uh, experiences with that work, in, in special institutions were established about that. And then, because such things happened, as you mentioned, in Germany, then uh, policy is sometimes very active because it happened and the next day we need a solution. Uh, and then uh, immediately money is there uh, to give money, but there's no good instruments there how to deal with that money. Activismus, how to call it in activism. Activism, activism which is short-minded.
Britain in politics, and I am a little bit afraid if we bring it to the European level, where and who is there really in the long term uh, education and communication really to establish strategies which are possible in such different societies as Poland, Hungary, Germany, Portugal, France, and, uh, and whatever. I think differentiation is better. It could be that some money could be there, and you can get it for that. But the strategies uh, have to be established and done for a special situation. You have to have in the background of a society. If I see, for instance, the Hungarians, you have a split society. Um, it, it is almost not possible to have a conference and from both different camps, political camps of the country, to bring people to the same table. Today, they are members of the European Union. And it, it is uh, the case that is very difficult. And so um, that's why I'm a little bit skeptical about European uh, programs um, in that way. And now the last long lecture about <laughs> Germany uh, and foreign policy. Um, I agree that German unification, but not only German unification, but also uh, the independency of sovereign states after communism was uh, a special situation after that breakthrough uh, of democracy 20 years ago. And we have to understand, and many people in the West didn't understand, that that kind of a national awareness, the awareness of national identity of people in the Soviet Union, if you see the Baltic states, they were occupied for decades. And then they got the opportunity to be sovereign countries. After many decades, it was very clear that they were proud to be Estonians to be Latvians, and so on. Uh, that has to be understood, and that they are, have had to solve the question uh, that 40% uh, of the population of that country uh, were Russians, brought from the Soviet Union there, and how to deal with that. On the one hand, to accept that these Russians have the same rights, but on the other hand, uh, to establish uh, really that Estonian or Latvian identity in that country. You know all that uh, difficulties which we had uh, with the European Union, OSCE, and so on, uh, with Van der Stoel, uh, to get and find good ways for that. But I think at first it has to be understood that including um, national identity uh, could be an important part and dimension of reaching uh, freedom. But the danger is clear. Uh, we had that, that danger uh, not only there, but we had that experiences of the, in the Balkan, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, in which on the one hand uh, they wanted to be independent, on the other hand uh, that all their own behavior towards uh, their own minorities. And if I say on the one I think that it is important to ex uh, accept uh, the independence of Kosovo. But it is a long way, and we have to push the politicians there, but not only the politicians. We have to help to develop acceptance not only for Kosovo, Kosovars uh, and not only for Serbs, but also for uh, Roma uh, living there, which is not the case today. Roma can't live there freely in that country. That's why I think I'm against to bring people there from Germany. Um, and so this is a really difficult situation. Uh, so on the one hand, I think we in Europe, we have and we have to live with national states. But we have to understand that all what is the, the task of states, usually we can't do alone mm -hmm. in Europe. Welfare, if you see the economic situation, welfare can't by a national state alone be 
uh, served for the people, or cared for the people. Uh, security, environment, uh, environmental situation, all, the, all of that, and there's only three examples, all of that has to be done together. And so in my view, a responsible state has to be not only accept, has to bring forward uh, deeper integration. And I, I would say it is it's a German interest uh, go forward uh, with that integration. This was for a long time the second identity of Germany, uh, and that's why I personally was really angry uh, in some situations in which we violated that policy. Uh, I can give you two. Uh, examples for that. One point was the right decision, my personal view, the right decision of Chancellor Schröder not to take part in the Iraq war. I really convinced that it was the right decision. But the way he implemented it, in my view, was a problem. Uh, to bring together France and Russia the three big with Germany, and neglecting the little partners in Europe. That was, had a tendency to destroy what we in our speeches said all the time. We are in favor of common European foreign policy. He himself said it, but at the same time, he didn't implement it because of that so-called axe. That, that was a problem. The same with the current government now. If I see that we have really, that we have really a wonderful chance, after the Lisbon Treaty agreed, after a very very difficult process, uh, we agreed with the Lisbon Treaty to establish the foreign policy to uh, with more integration and to establish the institutions for that, uh, and in the same time. Uh, developing a new strategic concept for NATO, uh, which gives the opportunity uh, to reflect uh, in a new way the EU-NATO uh, relationship, which is with Cyprus and Turkey another problem. I can't mention it more. Um, but um, to have that chance, and then Germany is doing nothing, or worse. Um, on the one hand, nothing. I haven't seen any initiative from Germany during the last years uh, really to bring forward a concept with NATO EU and with EU itself. Um, and then the personal issues, uh, together with France, uh, to look for people who are as weak as possible, uh, not to strengthen the European institutions, which we experienced, is a disaster in my view. Uh, you can add it with other things, with Greece and uh, so on. I, I only would like to bring these two points. So I think this is it, what we have to debate, uh, to be very frank, to be very clear, because in my view, it's our interest. It's really, I'm deep, co deeply convinced, it's our interest to make strong Europe. And that means to make strong European institutions. Uh, if we see the security issues, that we as Germans, in our law, uh, have the question of the staff uh, in NATO or in uh, troops in EU. Uh, in my view, it is, a, it is not possible, it is not good, that uh, we as Parliament say, if we don't take part in an action, then the staff has to be put out too. That's crazy, because staffs have to be established in an integrated structure. And although, for instance, if we would not take part in an action, we had to leave that staff officers in the staff in order to make function uh, that integrated security staff, uh, security structures. That's only some example, but we can could continue it in a long way. But I really think uh, that it is our national interest 
to establish that international and especially European structures. And the last point, your question with the, uh, the seat in the Security uh, Council. In that point, I would say the best would be to change the structure to make it possible that the European Union could get two or three places. Uh, this would be the best. But the treaty is not so. And so uh, the first step uh, would be, um, it, and Germany never said, uh, we would like to be there neglecting the others. If you remember uh, five years ago, that was very clear that it was uh, from the other uh, continents have to be included. It has to be really a restructured situation. And I think uh, that Germany really can take part much. And I think that a behavior, which is not the case with France and Great Britain, never it happened that Great Britain and France brought their decision-making process to the EU to discuss about that and in the end to follow the agreed line. This would be a good step. I can't see that it has happened. But that exactly was with Mr. Schröder when the Germany five years ago had the same aim, said we would do so. We would, and by that, by example, we would like to press a European communication about our own voting uh, in the Security Council. So I think there are some good arguments for that, but the priority is not the German seat. The priority is the reform of the Security Council. That has to be clear. <laughs>